Uh, well, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Aito, for the award, and thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, it is an incredible honor and my great pleasure to talk to you today about some of the work that I've done in the last decade or so. So, um, Roughly speaking, I work on developing and applying automated program verification and synthesis techniques to a wide range of problems, from computer science to other fields. To be a little bit more specific, I work at the intersection of two areas, formal methods and programming languages. On the formal method side, I develop and apply constraint solvers. So anything from satisfiability solvers to SMT solvers to solvers for more uh, exotic logics, such as the relational logic that you're going to see today. On the people side, uh, I work on creating tools and languages that help other people use these tools, these amazing solvers, to solve problems that are of interest to them without necessarily having to become formal methods experts themselves. Now, as all of you know, uh, SAT solvers and SMT solvers are essentially tackling problems that are fundamentally intractable. In principle, nothing that I do should work, right? Uh, in practice, however, we are able to make these solvers work on very big instances and solve real problems in the real world by careful application of domain knowledge. And essentially, the game that I play in my research, and we're going to see a little bit about of that today, is building the right abstractions. And the right abstractions in the sense that they enable human beings to express the main knowledge that's easy for a person to say in such a way that a solver can take advantage of it to effectively explore these intractably large search spaces that we're going to be generating as we try to solve real world problems. So these three words, solvers, languages, and tools, are going to be the themes of my talk. Uh, in particular, I'm going to tell you about one instance of each that I've built over the years. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the solver called Kotkod, which is based by reduction on satisfiability modular theories. Uh, then I'm going to tell you about a tool that I developed while I was a researcher at IBM Research called MEMSAT, which uses uh, constraint solvers to verify memory consistency models against their litmus tests. I'm going to talk about these two briefly because they're prior work, uh, and I'm going to spend most of my talk uh, on the current research that I'm doing, uh, that I've been doing for the last uh, three years or so, on a programming language called Rosette, which makes interaction with a constraint solver a first-class concept, a first-class construct in the language. Making interaction with a solver a first-class concept in the language makes it possible for people uh, who are programmers but don't know anything about solvers to actually build verification and synthesis tools for a variety of domains. I will conclude the talk by kind of making a full circle and telling you about a tool that my student James Bornhall developed, which puts these three ideas together. So what James did by putting them together is for the first time develop a system, which we call MemSynth, uh, that is capable of synthesizing memory consistency models uh, uh, in relational logic uh, from their litmus tests. Now, if these words don't make any sense to you yet, don't worry, they will as the talk goes on. At a high level, all of this work that I've done on solvers and tools and languages is motivated by a simple goal that I think many of you here share, uh, and that is essentially to use automated reasoning techniques to make programming easier for developers and accessible to everyone else. So now, I'm pretty sure that for this audience, I don't need to convince you why we want to make programming easier for developers. But let me spend a few minutes uh, to talk about why things like verification and synthesis are relevant to people who are not programmers, why they might want these tools, and why they might want to care about them. So I will do that by giving you three examples of non-programmers who could and in fact have benefited from tools uh, for synthesis and verification. So the first one here, this little guy, is our social scientist. Uh, normally, today, social scientists, the way they do their jobs is they collect huge amounts of data uh, from social networking sites, and they would like to analyze this data to answer some interesting questions. Before they can analyze the data, however, they have to put it in a form that's amenable to analysis. So how do you transform? Uh, if you have a huge mess of mental data, how do you transform it? Well, if you don't know how to program, you're kind of stuck. You have to do it by hand, right? 
Um, what they would like to do is apply a desired transformation to several pieces of data, show several examples of it to a computer, and have the computer synthesize a program that can transform the rest of the data. Now, biologists have a similar problem. What they're interested in doing is having computer models, executable models of what's happening within a cell. If you have such a model, you can use it to answer interesting questions uh, about nature and in particular about the development of diseases in various organisms, including human beings. The way they would like to build these models is not to program them in MATLAB or Python or whatever your favorite programming language is. Instead, they would like to give a computer a set of input-output examples. Here is a mutation that I applied to an organism. Here's what happened to it. What is a computer model? Uh, what what um, program that describes uh, what's happening in the cell explains these hypotheses. So here, synthesis is also relevant. Uh, biologists would like to have synthesis tools that can answer uh, such, a, su such a question for them. Finally, uh, hardware engineers and hardware designers and computer architects are now spending a lot of time coming up with new architectures. And uh, if you haven't heard, the, moral, the, the Moore's law is ending. Uh, so the way that we're trying to cope with it is by building chips that are parallel or very low energy. Now, when you build these new chips, you have to provide certain abstractions in order to make them usable to compilers and developers. For example, memory consistency models and cache coherence protocols. Getting these specifications correct is very tricky, as we'll see later on, uh, and computer uh, and hardware engineers and architects would like to have help uh, verifying that the specifications they come, come up with are correct and also synthesizing them uh, from some kinds of examples, as we'll see later on. Now, the main problem is that currently there's a huge gap between the potential users of these technologies and people who can build this automation for them. In fact, for all the examples that I've just listed, uh, researchers have developed tools uh, that act actually do these things, that perform synthesis and verification in the domain of uh, spreadsheets, so for data manipulation, in the domain of biology, uh, for cache coherence protocols, and memory models. The main issue is that developing even one of these tools is extremely difficult and time consuming. Generally speaking, if you're a PhD student and you develop one, you get a PhD. If you're less lucky, you get a PLDR or a couple paper. Uh, so what I've been doing in the last few years is essentially trying to answer the question of whether it is possible to make this process easier. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about for the most part uh, is this idea of solver-aided languages. So developing a computer programming language that makes it possible for people who know how to program, uh, including high school students, uh, to develop their own verification and synthesis tools without becoming experts in formal methods. So here's what the rest of the talk is going to look like. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, review what solver-aided tools are. Uh, what kind of things, what kind of interesting questions about programs you can answer if you put a constraint solver inside of a loop. Uh, and I will tell you about the two tools that I've built, so the Code Code Solver and the MEMSAT tool. Uh, then I'll talk about how these, this work over the years has uh, given rise to this idea of solver-aided languages. Uh, you, we will see one particular language called Rosette. I will show you how to use Rosette to build a verifier and a synthesizer for a simple language in about 50 lines of code. Uh, then I'm going to show you how it all works, so what makes this possible, and what was hard about it to begin with, and I will conclude by reviewing some of the latest applications of Rosette, including that Mimson tool that I mentioned at the beginning. All right. So what's a solver-aided tool? Um, I will talk about it by example. Uh, normally, when we think of programming, the task of programming is essentially having some specification in your mind of what you want the computer to do. And what you're doing when you're programming, you're trying to translate that idea into code. You're trying to write an implementation for it. If you don't have any tools and you're developing programs, how do you make sure that what you wrote matches the specification in your mind? What do you do? Absolutely, you test it. 
Uh, and uh, the way that we're going to do that on the slide here is by writing this predicate safe, which is this correctness assertion. And safe is going to return true if P produces a correct output, otherwise it's going to return false. And this assertion is going to fail, of course, if P behaves incorrectly on a given input. So when you're testing, you can do this on one concrete input at a time. So here, for example, uh, P is correct. It is safe on the input 2. Now, what happens when we bring a constraint solver into this loop, a Saturn SMT solver, it allows you to ask questions like this, and richer questions, as we'll see, but apply to all inputs of a given type. For example, we can ask things about the behavior of this program P on all 32-bit integers or 64-bit integers. This space is huge. It's certainly not something that you can explore by brute force testing. And that's what a solver allows you to do. So let me give you four examples of tools that you can build with solvers. So these are just four examples. Uh, you can have many other ones, and you will see some citations coming up on the slide, which are some specific instances of these tools that people uh, have built over the years. So the first question that you can ask uh, the solver is the so-called verification query. Is there an input X on which this program violates the specification? The way we ask the solver this question is we take the semantics of this program P, we express it as a formula in the logic that the solver understands, and then we ask the solver to search for an X. We basically ask it a satisfiability question. Does there exist an X such that uh, the program P, when applied to X, violates the safety assertion? If there is, the solver will return something called a model, and we can lift the model uh, into a concrete input on which the program fails. So in this case, this is the input 42. Now, normally when you program and you found a test case, a concrete example in which your program failed, let's say 42, what do you do next? You bug it, absolutely. So the uh, so solver can actually help us do that as well. Uh, so what we do is we ask the solver for an answer to this question, which is unsatisfiable, right? So I gave it a formula that I know has no solution. Right? We just did verification. We know that X is, 40, uh, X is 42 is wrong, so not safe, is, not safe of P is true, so safe of P cannot be true. Even in this case, the solver can actually help. It can produce something called a minimal unsatisfiable core. When you lift that to things that are meaningful at the level of programming language, you get a smallest subset of expressions in this program, at least one of which you have to fix in order to make this program pass on this particular input. Okay, so we've done some fault localization. We've isolated, let's say, that expression x plus 2. That's buggy. Uh, what can we do with that? Well, there are two things. First of all, we can repair a single run of this program. We would replace this buggy expression with a call to choose. And some of you may recognize this as angelic non-determinism, an old idea that goes back to Floyd. Um, but essentially what it does is it invokes an angelic oracle, in our case, a constraint solver at runtime. And the constraint solver produces a value, uh, let's say 40, such that all the assertions downstream are going to pass. So this is dynamic repair. We are repairing a particular execution of this program. Of course, this is very expensive. You don't really want to invoke the solver at runtime if you don't have to. Um, so another thing that we can do is, if we find this bug early enough, is actually ask the solver to repair the program for us. The way that we do that is we replace that buggy expression with double question marks, which tells the solver to search a finite set of expressions uh, for one such for one expression e, so we have this existential quantifier here, such that if we put e instead of those double question marks, the resulting program is going to be correct on all inputs x. So essentially, all of these things that I've just shown, uh, verification, debugging, solving, or angelic execution, if you want to call it that, and synthesis, they're all instances of using a SAT solver or an SMT solver, essentially asking, uh, posing a question about your program as a satisfiability query to some underlying automated reasoning engine. Now, 
before uh, we talk about what's hard to build these, what's hard about building these engines and why you might want uh, a language that helps you program tools like this, um, let me brief you, briefly tell you about tools that I have built in the past. Uh, one of them is called CodeCod and the other one is called Memsat. And we'll see how working on these things actually inspired uh, the recent work that I'm going to talk uh, to you about next. Uh, all right, so does anyone here know what Alloy is? Anyone? Okay, wow, that's great. Uh, okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Alloy is a, this beautiful specification language that was developed by Daniel Jackson, my advisor at MIT. So what's great about Alloy? Uh, it combines first-order logic with relational algebra and set theory and transitive closure. This particular combination of features makes it highly suitable for reasoning and writing down the properties of software systems in general and object-oriented systems in particular. So Alloy was around long before I joined Daniel's group, uh, and it had already become popular by the time I joined. Uh, in fact, people have used it to uh, specify and check uh, systems of various kinds, including the core distributed protocol. So Alloy was always built uh, kind of to fit this template. We wanted to have a language and we wanted to have sad based tools for doing verification, debugging and solving for this language. Now what happened is more people were using Alloy, they started trying to use it for, which, for things for which it wasn't designed. They would actually try to build tools on top of Alloy, they would generate these huge relational formulas and the Alloy analyzer, the solver that was supposed to solve these formulas, just couldn't handle them. And this is basically where I came in. Uh, my PhD thesis was to build a solver called CodeCod, uh, which has replaced the old Alloy engine. It is the new engine behind Alloy. Uh, and it essentially, due to a new translation, so uh, essentially replacing this box with a new compiler from the semantics of this language to constraints, uh, allowed this tool to have uh, orders of magnitude uh, improvements in performance. Now, there are many details, many reasons as to why this was possible, why Cocker was able to do this. But the most important one is that it exposed, it added a new abstraction to Alloy. In particular, it gave Alloy users, either human users or tools, a new way to express domain knowledge that you could always express in Alloy, but solver, the solver couldn't use it. Um, so the basic idea is essentially to not only give the solver a specification in this first order logic with relations, but to give it an additional piece of information, something that I call a partial model. And the basic idea is as follows. Normally when you're trying to ask a solver to do things for you, to essentially find a solution to a problem, oftentimes you already know parts of the solution. So one classic example is a Sudoku puzzle. When somebody gives you a Sudoku puzzle, they give you part of the solution, right? So the constraint solving problem is not to find that three is in this cell, right? It's to essentially use the rules of Sudoku, those constraints, to find out what should be the values in the remaining cells. Now, you don't need partial models to express this. So partial models don't give you any express, additional expressiveness. You could, in fact, just generate constraints uh, that essentially give you the same thing semantically. But if you give it to this tool as a partial model, it can use that information to reduce the search space, the size of the search space exponentially. And that was basically the big win. Here's this information that you already know. In other specification languages, you're forced to express this information as constraints, but if you're willing to express it as a partial model instead, you get exponential reduction in the search space. And that's why Kotker was able to do uh, what Alloy couldn't. Uh, in fact, since its public release, first public release in 2007, uh, it's been used for over 70 tools to do various kinds of things for analyzing Java code, to analyzing Java API, uh, web apps, networks, and so on. Uh, and it has been the basis of 12 PhD theses in addition to mine. Uh, one of these tools, uh, the one that I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about, uh, is this tool for memory models called Memsat. Now, before I proceed, uh, does everyone know what a memory model is? Who doesn't? Okay, enough people don't. Great. Um, so, to review uh, very briefly, a uh, memory model is essentially is, is an essential piece of information that you have to have in order to understand how a concurrent program behaves. 
More specifically, a memory model is a set of rules or axioms that determine which rights to shared memory a given read is allowed to see. Programming languages such as Java have a memory model, C++ has a memory model, all architectures, PowerPC, x86, and so on, have their own memory models. Now, writing these constraints, writing these axioms is actually really tricky. Uh, and most people, even when they're formalized, they often are not, uh, they can't really read the specification. So the way that uh, people who design memory models communicate the meaning of the models to other people is by providing litmus tests. Litmus tests are small concurrent programs that exhibit a behavior that should be forbidden or allowed by the rules. So what you're seeing on the slide is kind of a classic litmus test that almost every memory model includes. And uh, this is basically what it does. We have two shared memory locations, X and Y, and both of them are set to zero at the beginning of the program. Then we have two threads running in parallel, the, read and, uh, the red thread and the green thread. And what they're doing is they read the values of the X and Y into temporary registers, so lo thread local variables A and B. Uh, then they write one to the opposite memory location. What we would like to know is whether it is possible at the end of this program, at the end of this execution, any execution of this program, to be in a state in which both threads have seen one in their, into the, have read one into their local registers. So what does everyone think? Is this possible? Is it? It shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I, I know some people who would agree with you. Uh, well, uh, if, if you think that it isn't or it shouldn't be, you're probably thinking of the arguably most intuitive memory model, which unfortunately nobody implements. Um, and it's called sequential consistency. So sequential consistency says that uh, when we think about this concurrent program executing, we should think about it as interleaving the instructions that are running in parallel. So possible executions of this program include the red thread, thread running to completion, then the green thread, uh, some interleaving of the instructions, and so on. We can easily enumerate all of them for this particular litmus test. And if you do that, you will find that this particular behavior is disallowed by sequential consistency. It turns out, however, that just about every memory model that's actually implemented allows this behavior. It seems, seems like a crazy thing to do, except that I want you to think what would happen if I took that red thread and I reordered those two instructions. Am I allowed to do that? Can I reorder them? Yes, inside of one thread, I'm allowed to reorder them. This is, this is a classic co compiler transformation. It's also something that, that hardware will do for you with store buffering, right? Uh, it is allowed to reorder reads and writes, accesses to independent memory locations. If your memory model allows this reordering, then all of a sudden, this particular litmus test becomes an allowed behavior. So most memory models are so-called relaxed memory models, and they allow this sort of reordering. Now, reasoning about memory models is really difficult. Getting them right, writing them down is really difficult. Uh, the thing that MEMSA did, uh, which was unique, uh, so there are many tools for verifying that a memory model, this set of rules, actually allows or disallows the behaviors of the litmus test as specified. The thing that MEMSA was able to do uh, is actually apply this kind of reasoning to complex uh, programming language level memory models, including the Java memory model. Uh, it was the first tool, and I believe still the only one, to automatically verify the Java memory model against its litmus test. So it confirmed some of the tests that were disputed. So people who wrote the Java memory model thought that they should go one way. Some other people thought they should go the other way. So Memsat agreed with the creators of the JMM. And it found some bugs in revisions of the JMM that were supposed to address other bugs. Why was it able to do this? Uh, by the way, it might not seem like a big deal to find those interleavings in sequential execution. And it's actually not. Sequential execution is pretty easy as far as these things go to verify. The job memory model, what makes it hard is it's enormous state space. So it's not actually just looking for one interleaving. It's, if you want to think about it that way, it's looking for a sequence of interleavings that are related by a set of relations. So the constraint solving problem is really difficult. 
So what made it possible for Mimset to solve this problem uh, was basically a similar kind of trick that made Kafka possible, adding domain knowledge, exposing the right abstraction. In this case, the abstraction was to represent litmus tests uh, in relational logic. So we would represent the static properties of the program, such as control flow as relations, which we would expose to you, dynamic properties as well, such as the happens before order. Then you specify your memory model in terms of these relations. After that, we do aggressive static analysis to populate these relations with partial models. And then Kotkot can take advantage of them and essentially um, work even in these very large search spaces. So those are some of the examples of solver ADA tools that I did uh, for my PhD and a few years afterwards. Uh, and I built a few more after that. Uh, and eventually, I joined uh, Ross Bodek uh, back when uh, he was at Berkeley. I joined his research group as a research scientist. And Ross said, well, let's build one more. And I thought, wow, I seem to be doing this a lot. So let's find a way to automate it. What is hard about building these tools? And how can we make the hard part easier? So let me give you a brief um, insight into how this process works. So we have a tool expert. Uh, that's me back when I had longer hair. Uh, so the first thing uh, that the tool expert has to do uh, is learn the problem domain. So you talk to the expert. You figure out what exactly is the problem that they have. Uh, and after learning that, you have to figure out um, what kind of domain language, or if you want to think about it, the main specific language you have to design to enable these people who are going to be using your tool to express their problems and enable you as the tool designer to actually solve them. So this is the most critical part of the process, actually designing a domain specific language for your domain. Now, the hardest part of the process, however, comes next. And that is building that translation box Remember what I said at the beginning, the thing that you have to do is you have to translate the semantics of programming language to constraints. This is the hardest part. This takes months or years of work to build a symbolic compiler which takes its input of programming language and produces a set of efficiently solvable constraints. Because if they're not efficiently solvable, your tool is not going to be able to cope with real instances. So what Ross and I wanted to find out was essentially whether it's possible to take this middleman out, to take me out of the picture. So here's how the process should work in this new world. Uh, basically, we have a domain expert who knows how to program, or a programmer who has become a domain expert. Uh, so what they do is they have to design domain-specific language. You have to do that anyway. Whenever you build a tool or an API, you're designing a small language. So once you do that, and you implement an interpreter for your language, or an API, or something like that, you should be able to get this symbolic compiler for free. And all the tools that go with it. That was the dream. That's what we wanted. It turns out that this is, in fact, possible. And the way that you achieve it is by building your interpreter uh, in a special kind of programming language, which, which we call a solver-aided host language. Once you do that, the host language can take the implementation of your DSL and a program running on top of that DSL and translate both of them to efficient constraints. So this is what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Uh, first, I will tell you what solver-aided languages are, what they look like, and how you build them. Then I will tell you how we deal with this tricky question, how do you actually take how do you actually build a meta compiler, right? Not just the compiler for a single programming language, but something that can take an interpreter and a language running on top of that interpreter and reduce it to constraints. All right. So first, a very brief review. Uh, this is going to be familiar to everybody in the audience, but I'm just going to go over it uh, and so, so I don't snowball you with jargon. Uh, the main specific language, or a DSL, uh, is a special purpose language, usually less powerful than a general purpose language. It doesn't have to be. It can be Turing complete, but usually less powerful. And it exposes abstractions that make it easy to solve problems in a certain domain. Normally, we build DSLs by implementing them in a general purpose language, which we call a host language. This implementation process is called embedding. And there are two ways to do it. One is to write an interpreter, and the other one is to write a library or an API. Uh, 
you have seen, or most of you have probably used some of the DSLs on the slide here, uh, and same for these uh, general purpose languages. In fact, any general purpose language can be a host language, but some are better than others in the sense that they have constructs that are designed explicitly for metaprogramming. For example, Racket has macros and Scala has uh, staging. So these things make it easy to build new languages on top of these hosts. Uh, now the question is, what, is why bother with DSLs? Right? I mean, clearly anything that you can implement in a general purpose language, in the DSL you can do it in general purpose language. And the answer is essentially, uh, going back to the idea of abstractions, is that the DSL give you the right abstractions. They essentially narrow the gap between what you have in your mind, the spec, what you want to say, and what you write down. So what you see here on the slide is matrix multiplication expressed in a linear algebra DSL versus matrix multiplication expressed in C++ or Java. So this is not just easier for human beings to read, it is actually better for the tools as well, because any tool that's operating on this DSL can take advantage of the knowledge that matrix multiplication is associative. And that is not the kind of knowledge that you can, in general, extract from code that looks like this. So this is why DSLs have become hugely popular, and this is why we decided to target DSLs uh, as ways to sneak verification and synthesis into your daily lives. Uh, and how do we do it? Well, it turns out that the solver Ada language stack looks just like a normal language stack with one difference. The host language runs on top of a non-standard virtual machine, which I will call the symbolic virtual machine. This is the thing that is capable of translating both the host and the interpreter and the program running on top of the interpreter to constraints. I will talk about one particular host language. So since I developed Rosette, there actually has been a few more, but I will talk about Rosette. Uh, and to give you some ideas of what it has been used for, what you can use these ideas for, here are some words on the slide. I'm not going to go through them in detail now, but I will come back to some of these applications at the end. But as you can see, it's a very wide range of domains. All right. So what is Rosette? Uh, it is actually an extension of Racket, tiny extension of Racket. So Racket was one of those host languages that I mentioned. And it is a descendant of Scheme with very powerful metaprogramming constructs in the form of macros. Rosette extends Racket with six new language constructs. And I will tell you what those six are. I will actually show you their semantics by example. And here is the example. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to build a bunch of tools for a toy programming language. I'm going to call this language BV, which stands for bit vectors. Uh, but basically what we want to do is we want to implement fast low level libraries. So one example of such a library routine is this BV max procedure that takes as input two 32 bit integers and computes their maximum without any branching. Pretty cool, right? So what do we want to be able to do with BV programs? Well, obviously we want to be able to execute them. So we want to be able to test them. We want to be able to verify them, uh, debug them, and synthesize repairs if needed. So that's our tool example. How are we going to do it? Uh, four steps. First, I will show you an interpreter for BV, which is about 10 lines of code, and then you'll get everything else pretty much for free. And here is how the interpreter is going to work. Um, I'm going to show you what's happening by uh, showing you the behavior of the interpreter on this particular input, minus 2, 1. So the first thing that happens, of course, is we're going to parse. Uh, this particular representation into some abstract syntax tree. I'm using a particularly simple AST, it's just a list of lists. Each of the lists represents one instruction. The first number in the list is the identifier of the output register. The second symbol in the list, you can think of it as a string if you're not familiar with racket symbols, is the opcode, the name of the instruction we want to run. And the remaining integers are the identifiers of the input registers. So we want to apply this instruction to the value in these registers and store the result in the output register. Very simple. So we're going to take this AST and our input and give it to our interpreter. So I will walk you very quickly through what the interpreter does, how it works. So the first thing that it does, it creates enough registers to execute the program. It's just a vector, an array. Our programs are very simple. They're in static single assignment form. So we know that we only need uh, six registers in this case, the length of the program. We're going to populate the first n registers with program inputs, and then we're going to use Racket's pattern matching to bind the local variable out, opcode, and in 
to the output register, the opcode, and the input register. So this, this variable is bound to a list of values in the first instruction. So in this case, out is going to be 2, uh, opcode is going to be uh, BVGE, and inputs are going to be 0 and 1. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to use eval. If you're familiar with JavaScript, this is the same kind of eval. It's going to do dynamic evaluation. It will take this opcode and look up in the environment the procedure object that is bound to this opcode. Uh, next, it's going to load the values of the input registers into this local variable arguments. Uh, it's going to apply the procedure to the arguments and store the result into the output register. We will do this for all of the instructions in the program, and we will return the value in the last register as the output of the program. You can see on the slide there that a program produced the correct output. In this case, the maximum of minus 2 and minus 1 is minus 1. So there is nothing tricky or particularly exciting about this interpreter, right? It's just 10 lines of code. It's very easy to write. Anyone can do it. The thing that's interesting about this interpreter, however, is that it uses just about every feature in Racket that you can imagine that everybody who works in formal methods or any kind of automated tool really hates, right? It uses eval. It uses um, side effects, first class procedures, higher order procedures, and pattern matching. And I want you to keep this in mind because we have to translate this thing to constraints, right? There has to be a logical formula coming out. So this is what I want you to keep in mind for a few minutes. But before I tell you how this is actually done, uh, let me quickly show you how you use Rosette to implement these tools. Uh, the first tool that I'm going to show is verification. So how you implement, implement a verification for our language BV. Uh, so the interface is very simple. It takes as input an implementation and a specification, so reference implementation. I'm not showing you what max looks like on the slide, but you can imagine that it's the obvious implementation of max that uses a conditional, right? So what we do next is we use this defined symbolic construct. What this does, it creates two constants of type integers, two fresh constants of type integer, and bind them to, bind them to the local the, the racket variables n0 and n1. Now, symbolic constants are just like concrete constants. You can use them in the same way as concrete constants. The main difference is that their meaning, their concrete interpretation, is not known at compile time. It's not even known at runtime. It only becomes known at solve time. The solver eventually determines the concrete interpretation for these values. The only thing that Rosette knows about them is that they're integers. So once we do that, uh, this, this basically demonstrates what I just said, that you can treat them just like concrete values. You can put them in a data structure, no problem. You can pass them to our interpreter, no problem. So now we're finally ready to build our verifier, and here it is. We're going to implement verification for BV in terms of the verify query that Rosette provides. And the semantics of this query is as follows. This expression can be arbitrary code. In this case, we just have a simple assertion that says that for all concrete uh, integers, n0 and n1, uh, these two procedures behave identically. So the meaning of this, what, what Rosette is going to try to do, is to search for a concrete interpretation if one exists, such that at least one assertion, in our case just this one, is violated. Uh, it turns out that such an interpretation exists. So it's 0 minus 2. And because we can execute our code, we can check that it is, in fact, bad. So when we apply b max to 0 minus 2, the result is minus 1, which is clearly wrong. Can anyone see where the bug is? No, I didn't ask that seriously. Um, so what we're going to do is actually we're going to use the solver to tell us where the bug is. I will not walk you through the implementation of debugging a synthesis, but I'm going to be showing the code here just to convince you that it's a small amount of code. I will tell you the input-output behavior of these tools, however. That's what I'm going to talk about. So the API for this debug procedure is it takes as input an implementation, so bvmax, a specification, a reference procedure, and the input on which they differ. Uh, then it asks the solver to compute a minimal subset of these register expressions such that you have to change at least one to make the program bvmax correct on this particular input. So here it shows a bunch of them. We could try fiddling with them to see uh, how to rearrange them, how to change them to make this correct, or we can just replace them with these double question marks and then call the synthesis query. 
Uh, the synthesis query takes as input a an implementation, so BVMAX, uh, and um, sorry, a sketch of an implementation, so BVMAX with these holes in it, these question marks, and a specification, and it searches for register expressions that make BVMAX correct, so behave identically to Max on all inputs. And here is the answer. That was basically the correct answer. All right. So this is how what Rosette is. It's racket plus six constructs. Uh, one of them is very familiar. It's assertions. The other one is this notion of symbolic values. And the remaining ones are essentially those queries that I showed at the very beginning, that you can use the verification, symbolic, ex uh, angelic execution, debugging, and synthesis. What I'm going to do next is actually show you how this works. How Rosette can take that interpreter that I just showed you and a program running on top of it and translate it to constraints that an SMT solver can understand. All right, so at a high level, uh, this is what Rosette does. It takes as input a program uh, and an interpreter for it and a query about that program. It translates that to Z3. Uh, when Z3 produces an answer, we lift it back to something meaningful at the level of programming language. Z3 will produce an answer, of course, in the, mini, uh, uh, in the form of logical models and unsatisfiable cores. The challenge that we have to solve is how to do this efficiently in the presence of constructs that are very difficult to translate to constraints. We actually do, even, some of them we don't even know how to do it, uh, how to do it well. So we have, as I mentioned before, uh, this dynamic evaluation, pattern matching, and so on. And what we really want to get down to at the end is a logical formula, quantifier free. So everything that I work on is fully automatic, so there are no quantifiers. Uh, it means that we only reason about finite executions of procedures, so everything is quantifier-free in the theories of bit vectors, integers, reals, and uninterpreted functions. So those are the theories that are currently supported by Rosetta. All right, I will show you how this works on a particular example. So here's an example procedure that we're going to translate. It takes as input a list of positive, in sorry, a list of integers, uh, reverses it, and keeps only the positive ones. So if I give it 3, 1, minus 2, the output is going to be 1, 3. You might write that procedure in Python, and it might look, like, look like something like this, right? Very easy. The query that we want to ask about this procedure is, if somebody gives you a list with symbolic values, find a concrete interpretation of those values such that, at the end, the two lists, the input Vs and the output Ps, have the same length. Right? Very simple problem. Uh, so, uh, just to make sure that you understand what I just said, uh, what happens when I give this query, uh, this list A, B, where A and B are symbolic values, and I'm going to use the convention that symbolic values are shown in color and the concrete ones are shown in black and white. So, if I give it the list A, B, what constraints encode the meaning of this query? Yes. This is it. This is the simplest translation that you can imagine. It causes the semantics uh, of this loop, of these list insertions and everything. Basically, A and B have to be non-negative. That's what the solver has to search for. So let's see how we get there. Uh, before I do that, let me briefly remind you how people in general do this kind of reasoning, how they take a program and translate uh, finite executions of this program to constraints. There are two main methods of doing it. Uh, both of them are quite old. They go back to the 70s, some of them. Uh, so one of them is called symbolic execution, and the other one is called binary model checking. So they both have advantages and disadvantages, and what we're going to try to do is combine them in some way to get the best of both worlds. Uh, so symbolic execution works by encoding the meaning of this program path by path. So we start in a state in which Vs is bound to AB. We enter this loop. Now V is bound to A. When we get to this conditional, we have to make a choice. Do we consider the path in which A is greater than zero or the one in which A is less than or equal to zero? Let's suppose that we first consider the path in which A is greater than zero. So we record this decision, it's called a path condition, and then we execute uh, the then statement, and that will basically cause PS to, become to, the, to, be, to be bound to the list that contains A. All right, so then we go back around the loop, and now V is bound to B, and we have to make the same decision. So for variety, let's say that we first decide to check the case in which b is less than or equal to zero. We record that. The else branch does nothing. We exit the loop. We check the assertion. And we see that it's false. 
So these three formulas, their conjunction, encodes the meaning of this program along this one path. We will do this for all the paths, and this is the meaning of the entire program, execution on this particular input. As you can see, the problem with this encoding is that it's exponential. Right? This formula is going to be exponential uh, in the size of the input in this case. So, so for a list of a size n, is going to be to, to have uh, 2 to the n of these disjuncts. Now, let's see the alternative approach, bond and more checking, which avoids this exponential explosion. But there, of course, there is a catch. There is a price to pay for avoiding it. Uh, so what happens in bonded model checking is that when you enter the loop for the first time with V bound to A, you actually execute both branches. And you end up with two values for PS, right? So two separate states, uh, PS bound to A and PS bound to the empty list. Then you merge them. And then you proceed. So how do you merge them? Well, you create a new symbolic list called PS0, and this list will become the list A, or the empty list, depending on the value of this guard, right? You can basically see how this works. The main problem that happens is when I go back around that loop for the second time, and I try to execute um, insertion into that list, I can't do it concretely anymore, right? Because now PS is symbolic. I have no choice but to force the solver to reason about lists. Now, lists may not sound so bad to you, but imagine having to build a constraint so it can reason about all the other crazy things that we like to do in programming languages, right? So what we really want to do, and this is the problem that Rosette solves, is basically having our cake and eating it too, which in this case means having an encoding that's polynomial in size of the execution graph, and that is expressed solely in terms of these simple theories. So no lists, uh, no procedures, just uh, integers and reals and bit vectors, whatever it is that the solvers are good at reasoning about. So the way that we're going to do that is essentially performing a process that's similar to bond and more checking, but we're going to change the way that we're going to do merging. In particular, when we have two primitive values coming in, so let's, let's say a and b are integers, we're going to merge them in the same way that bond and more checking did. So we're going to create a new symbolic value I'm going to call it C. The C stands for an if-then-else expression like you saw in the previous slide. So that's treat, primitive values are treated just identically. The difference is what happens when we get a complex value, let's say a list. The way that these two are merged is if we have two values of non-primitive types that have the same shape, we're going to merge them in such a way that the output is also concrete. So if we have two lists of the same length, we're going to merge A and C to get E and B and D to get F. So the output of this process is still a concrete list. It's no longer, it's a concrete list with symbolic elements, but it's not a symbolic list. Now the tricky case is what happens when we can't do either of these base cases. So we have two data structures with different shapes, or we have a primitive value in data structure. We don't know how to merge that. The way that Rosette does it is by using a new kind of symbolic value, uh, which we call symbolic unions. And these are essentially sets of guarded values where all the guards are by construction disjoint and exhaustive. So under every concrete interpretation of these symbolic values, exactly one guard will evaluate the true. So let me show you why this helps, how this actually works uh, in translating our example program to constraints. So the first two steps are the same as von and more checking. We're going to execute both branches. And now I have a list of size 0 and a list of size 1. How am I going to merge them? Do they have the same shape? No. So we're going to use a union. Now when I go around the list for the second time, and, B is, and V is bound to B in this case, uh, when I'm examining the then branch, now I can execute this insertion procedure concretely on the elements of the union. I'm just going to push it through. And this is going to be the state of PS after the then branch. After the else branch, it's still the same. Nothing happens. Now, before I proceed, I have to merge these two unions. The obvious way to do this will not work. The obvious way to do this is to take the union, right? And what would happen if I just kept on taking the unions? 
Absolutely. I will get back to the case where I'm actually just doing symbolic execution and I'll get exponential explosion again. So the way that Rosette handles this is by performing merging um, with respect to a certain invariant. So the invariant is going to maintain is as follows. Every union is going to contain at most one value of a given primitive type. So at most one integer, at most one real, at most one boolean. And it's going to contain at most one value of a compound type that has a certain shape. So for list is going to contain at most one list of length two, at most one list of length and one and so on. And if you take this reasoning to its logical conclusion, you can see that if I apply the sol query to a list of size n, the resulting union would have n elements, not two to the n. Uh, so when, to just finish the example, when we evaluate this assertion at the end, uh, you will see that the only guard under which this assertion evaluates to true is G2. Uh, so what we're going to send to the solver is exactly the simple translation that we showed in the beginning, a is greater than zero and b is greater than zero. Um, this will give you, uh, it, uh, we proved this, and we also have uh, experimental data to support it, uh, but this will essentially give you a polynomial encoding in the size of the execution graph. And as you've seen, it enables partial evaluation. So we don't have to force the solver to reason about lists or anything like that. We essentially handle it uh, by partially evaluating these tricky procedures by pushing them through uh, into the elements of the union. So let me take the last few minutes to tell you very briefly some, about some of the recent applications of Rosette. Uh, so here are the ones published or submitted in 2016. There are more. It's been, it's been released uh, in 2014. Uh, I will zoom in on to three of them, uh, which show a range of things that you can do uh, with this approach and with this technology. Uh, the bottom one deals with safety critical systems. The one in the middle is something about education, and the one on top is, as I promised, going back to memory models. So let's start with the one at the bottom. So a bunch of colleagues uh, and myself, we have been working on a new approach for verifying end-to-end -end properties of cyber physical systems. So end-to-end -end means that we want to be able to verify properties that span not only the software, but the hardware and the physical components of the system. One particular system that we have been focusing on is called CNTS. This is the Clinical Neutron Therapy System at the University of Washington. It is a type of radiation therapy machine that treats certain kinds of cancers with neutron radiation. This machine has been in operation for 30 years. So its components are very old. Its first software controller was written in Fortran. Its second one was written in C. And recently they built a new one. Uh, in order to keep up to date with the hospital systems and enable new therapies in this data flow language called EPIX. So as part of this larger verification effort, we of course had to build a verifier for the software as well. Uh, and we used Rosette to build a verifier for this EPIX data flow language. When we applied the verifier to a pre-released version of the therapy control software, we found safety critical defects that would have caused the beam to remain on while it should have been shut off. So basically risking uh, over radiation uh, and injury to the patient. So these faults have been fixed and the CNTS engineer, the CNT staff, uh, is actually now using this uh, Rosette-based verifier to check any updates or new features that they add to the, add to the software. The second application uh, is uh, actually industrial. Uh, so Rosette is now being used by a company called NLearn. It's an education technology company based in Seattle. And uh, they have used Rosette to develop educational math games uh, for kids to play and figure out, uh, for example, how to do long division and things like that. Uh, these have already been released to thousands of students in, in, in India. And the plan is to, reduce them to, uh, to, to release them to millions. Uh, what they're also working on right now, which I find very exciting, uh, is they're building a DSL based on Rosette. They call it a system, but I like to think of it as a DSL that will allow any teacher to build their own educational tools and games that are basically tailored uh, to their classroom and to their curriculum. So the final application that I will mention uh, is basically to tie it all together uh, is the system called Memsynth uh, that James has built. And uh, the basic idea is to essentially synthesize these memory model axioms. So when I was talking to you about Memsat and pretty much any tool that has been built for reasoning about memory models, they assume that these axioms are given along with this litmus test and expected uh, behavior of the axioms on this litmus test. 
But it turns out that just specifying the behavior, specifying these items is really hard. So for the PowerPC, it took over seven publications, over six years, by very smart people to formalize these axioms and to get them right. For x86, which is much less complex than PowerPC, it still took several publications and several years of work. So what we wanted to do is to actually synthesize the axioms themselves in relational logic. So what James did is he built a system called MemSynth, uh, which is implemented as a deep embedding, an interpreter in Kotka and in, in um, Rosette itself. So it implements the logic of Kotka, so relational logic plus partial models, and uses Rosette synthesis facilities to create the axioms uh, from a sketch. So the system takes as input a bunch of litmus tests and their desired outcomes. It takes a sketch of the axioms and produces the memory model for you if one exists. So James has used MemSynth uh, to synthesize the x86 memory model in about five seconds from the litmus tests that are specified in the Intel developer manual. Uh, the other thing that MemSynth can do, which is really cool, is not only can it give you this memory model, it has also found that the litmus tests given in the Intel manual are incomplete. They don't fully specify the x86 memory model. We can actually generate the remaining tests that are missing. There are about four of them. We have also been able to synthesize PowerPC in about 20 seconds. This is 20 seconds over 700 from over 700 litmus tests. So this thing is encoding the meaning of 700 concurrent programs, which is really cool. So it can be done in 20 seconds, and the 700 tests come from these previous formalization efforts for PowerPC. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, two unrelated questions. The, about the last piece of work, how do you know that you've actually synthesized something that doesn't just isn't just a tight fit to what you to the inputs? Because you said you found missing things, and I'd like to hear a bit about that. Second one, and I'm sure I've asked you this question before. Um, when you do the merging based on uh, structure, how do you make sure that the exponential doesn't get moved into the constraints that you generate on the side? The, the, the new symbolic variables that you create. Uh -huh. So that, that, that basic, so yes, so the second question uh, basically comes uh, from the way in which this is done in bottom model checking. Uh, because we're doing essentially the exact same thing for everything that's primitive as bonnet model checking, we're not producing those trees, we're actually doing graph sharing, we generate a DAG, even though I was showing trees. That's basically why it doesn't explode on the primitive values. Uh, the first question is uh, basically the usual Question that you, you can ask you can ask this and it's, it's the right question to ask about any tool that synthesizes things from examples. How do you know that you're not overfitting? Uh, in general, we don't. The way that you do it is by constraining the sketch. And we were able to do that because the people who have worked on these memory models before, we have used their work. They've developed a very nice general framework in which they give you the axioms and then they say, here are three relations such that if you specify these three relations differently, you will either get sequential consistency or power C or, or, or x86 and so on. So what we synthesize are those three relations and our grammar is basically the full alloy grammar. You mentioned at some point that um, you are not uh, supporting uh, quantifiers. I suppose all formulae are uh, exist uh, universally uh, quantified. Uh, can you expand a little bit on uh, the restrictions? Could you write a program verifier using Rosette? Uh, so right now you cannot write a program verifier in the sense that Daphne is a program verifier. In particular, uh, you can't write uh, loop, let's say, loop invariants that require uh, 
that require quantifiers. Uh, and the reason is that uh, we basically wanted to make this uh, completely automated. Uh, however, I actually am writing an extension of Rosetta right now, uh, which is going to be adding quantifiers because we found that uh, they can be uh, extremely useful for executing some of these queries more efficiently. So even though we have our own algorithms for doing synthesis without quantifiers, Right, I was showing quantifiers of the formula. Uh, we're actually doing the synthesis with a different algorithm that doesn't use quantifiers. Uh, quantifiers can be useful, which is why uh, I actually am adding them. So hopefully by the end of the summer, you could potentially, in theory, write something like that on top of Rosette. Any more questions? Yeah, so Thank you for a really interesting talk. And the example uh, with uh, this uh, SSA, uh, so we first found the mistake in our code and then synthesized with this question mark the right uh, solution. Mm -hmm. So that is to memorize the first uh, incorrect value input values and use them to synthesize the right answer or it just makes synthesis from scratch? It makes sense from scratch. So it means that we can just put question marks everywhere and the yes. probably finds the solution. Absolutely. In principle, <laughs> you can replace all of your code with, with double question marks. In practice, the solver is never going to come back. <laughs> so the game that basically you try to play is to give the least restricted sketch that you can that is still solvable. Uh, so it really helps in these cases to have these domain-specific languages, which goes back to answering Shuram's question is, you know, how are you doing dealing with these memory models? And the answer is that somebody developed a DSL. Uh, and they basically, this DSL says, where is it natural to put these double question marks? So we put them there and the synthesizer completes them. Okay. But in principle, you're right. You could put them anywhere. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I was wondering uh, how the verification and uh, synthesis uh, features uh, in the educational application that you were talking about at the end. So how is this used in, I guess, developing these uh, educational program? Um, so essentially, uh, the, the, what they're doing right now is uh, you develop a language and inside of this language you can write an algorithm, uh, a program that describes what it is that you taught the students. Uh, for example, you can write a, a kind of long division algorithm that you would teach a human being how to execute. So Rosette can execute all paths of this algorithm and generate problems for the kids to solve that will basically test their understanding of a particular path and to see if they had any bugs in it. And then if they misunderstood something, they can synthesize more problems along that path and things like that. So thanks for a very impressive talk. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, wondering about one thing. So when you have these 700 uh, litmus tests, um, it seems like you're sort of using a lot of work that somebody else did in order to create those litmus Absolutely. tests in, in the first place. And you're using this domain specific knowledge to, to make it easier to arrive at a solution. So what is a good approach to actually get those litmus tests as well uh, in, in order to sort of take the, the work that you've been do doing here and extend it to also cover some of these uh, popular and PLDI papers that have been used to come up with those tests. Can, can you do something to make that easier as well? Um, so again, it's, it's, one of those, it's, it's a question of uh, scalability. So in principle, yes. So in principle, Memsat, so uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning, so, so, sorry, I mentioned towards the end that it can actually tell you not only that here is a memory model, it can tell you here's a memory model, here are two memory models that behave identically on the test that you've given us so far and that differ on a particular distinguishing litmus test. So this is simultaneously synthesizing two memory models and a litmus test. So this works. It's slow. Uh, so we can actually augment these existing tests of litmus tests, but uh, always in synthesis and all of these tools, it's helpful if you can give it something to start with. So you could start the synthesis process from scratch. It would just take a really long time to converge. So it really helps to have these things and tools that people have developed in the past. <laughs> 